right, but like you take your Bible, go to Second Kings, if you would, this morning. Second Kings in your Bible, and uh, no title of the sermon, and uh, no introduction to the sermon, and uh, but the body of the sermon itself is 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 full and long, and uh, and I got plenty of time. I noticed. Wow. Okay. A couple of things. We, uh, well, at least one thing I want to mention. There, there will be a deacon's offering next week, just to let you know. I realized that wasn't in the bulletin, so we will have a deacon's offering uh, next week. Okay. We're going to be in Second Kings this morning. We're going to be Second Kings chapter 17. Okay. Second Kings chapter 17 in your Bible. I'm not going to read the entire chapter. I would like to, uh, and it, it's not that I'm trying to cut the word of God short, but. Uh, but we will look at quite a few verses through this. Okay, so I'd like to pray with you. Uh, then I'm going to read verses 5 and 6 and make a comment or two. I'm going to read verse 24, make a comment or two. I'm going to read verses 25 through 28 and say a few words. And then I'm going to read verse 29, 32 through 34, and 41 and say a few words. And then we'll get into the sermon. Okay, Heavenly Father, thank you for you. Uh, thank you for this time that we set aside um, to hear from you through your word. We're thankful for what we've experienced already in this time together with you and with one another in Christian fellowship. We're grateful for all this. We pray now during the sermon time, you help us to be attentive and receptive, Lord, to what you have for us uh, from your word today. I pray, Holy Spirit, you'd work it in our lives and, and speak to us as you know the needs, needs are. Um, in our walk with the Lord, in our relationships with others, in our ministries of the, of the church here. And we pray that uh, as this unfolds, uh, that we will definitely uh, uh, hear from you today. In your name, Lord, we pray. Amen. All right, so what I'm going to do, uh, what I'm going to do, like I said, I would like to read the entire chapter, but I'm not going to. Uh, we're in Second Kings chapter 17, and I'm going to read verses 5 and Six. So once again, you have a sermon from the Old Testament, you know, the Old Testament. Okay, so Second Kings 17 and verse 5, it says, The king of Assyria came up throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it three years. And in the ninth year of Oshia, the king of, As uh, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried uh, Israel away into Assyria and placed in them Hala and Habor by the river Gozan in the cities of the Medes. So what you have here in this, these couple of verses, what you have, you have uh, the Syrians come in full force. Uh, they're talking about uh, the northern kingdom, Israel. The capital was Syria. And the, the Syrians come in full force with their king and do battle, do battle, a three-year siege against the city of Samaria, the capital of Israel, the northern kingdom. And after that three-year siege, uh, uh, the capital city of Israel falls into the hands of the enemy. In essence, Israel is defeated and conquered by the Assyrians. And you see what you have there. Many, not all of them, but many of the Jewish people, the Israelites there, were taken, that, that did not die in, in battles and in the siege, were taken then into captivity and transported into the land uh, of the Assyrians. Now, some were left, but not many. Okay? So that happened. So, so we're done with that. Okay? So you have that. So you have uh, Israel's uh, uh, defeat and surrender and uh, its destruction. Now, verse 24, if you look at verse 24, and once this was done, there's some things in the verses before verse 24, but we're gonna, we're gonna get the picture. So we, we've, they're defeated, the Syrians take over, people are taken captive, going back into a foreign land. And, uh, and then what you have in verse 24, and the king of Syria brought men from Babylon and from Kepha and from Ava and from Hamath and from Zepharium and placed them in the cities of Samaria instead of the children of Israel. And they possessed Samaria and dwelt in the cities thereof. Okay. So what you have here is this. Once, once this, uh, this has taken place, uh, the Israelites are conquered. Uh, the city's taken, and um, much of the Israelis are taken back into Syrian land and resettled there. Uh, what you have now, what you, what you have, you have forced 
relocation of other foreigners that the Assyrians had conquered, okay, and 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 brought them in and resettled them in the northern kingdom of Israel and in Samaria. You understand? So there was forced relocation of other peoples into the land of Israel. Okay? And that's why even in Jesus' day, the Samaritans were despised by the other Jews because they were considered mixed. They weren't full Israeli because this is how that happened. All these other Gentile nations, these pagans, these heathens, eventually intermarried with the Jewish people that were left there in the land. Okay? Now, now that that happened, so the pagan, the heathens are there. They're in the land now. Forced relocation by the king of Assyria. That's where they're going to live now. Now you have verses 25 through 28. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there, these other peoples, foreign people of different lands, different places. They're living now in Israel and Samaria. At the beginning of their dwelling, that they feared not the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Wherefore they spake to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the city of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he, that's the God of the land, the, the, the God that we know, he, he hath sent forth, uh, we know personally, it, it, we know who he is. And he hath sent lions among them, and behold, they slay, uh, they slay them, because they know not the manner of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, saying, Carry thither one of the priests whom he brought from thence, and let them go and dwell there, and let them teach them the manner of the God of the land. Then one of the priests, whom they had carried away from Samaria, came and dwelt in Bethel, and taught them how they should fear the Lord. So what we have here, it's really interesting, okay? Interesting. What you have is this, what I call state-sponsored sectarian teaching. That's what you have. Here you've got this, the, the, the lions come in the land because these people are dishonoring the God of heaven. And the lions evidently are, are killing enough of them that it's got their attention and they're wondering, what are we going to do about this? We don't know the God of the land and the God of the land through the lions are coming to get us because we're ignoring this God who's in charge of this place that we've come to live in. So they petition the king to send somebody to help us so we know what to do about the God in the land so we can honor him. So, you know, he, he calls off, not the dogs, he calls off the lions. And that's exactly what happens. They find a priest from Bethel. Uh, they commission him to come back into the land and teach the people how to fear the God of heaven. To teach them about, about, about God, about his law, about his ways, so they could actually honor him. So, so I find that pretty, pretty uh, interesting. That's actually the case, and I think that's pretty neat, you know, what happens. And uh, so that's what takes place. You have what I call state-sponsored sectarian teaching taking place. So the people that have been imported into the land now will learn about the God of heaven. That's pretty neat. I like that. Now what I'm going to do now, so you understand, so you have defeat, captivity, you have, you have forced okay, uh, relocation of other peoples into the land of Israel. These people don't know God. They're ignoring him. So he says, well, the lions will get your attention. So you decide what you're going to do with me because I rightfully belong here. This is my land, and this is, these are my people okay, that were here before. And so now, now they're being taught about the God of heaven. And, and, and then what you have in verse 29, what I want to read to you. At verse 29, okay, he said, How be it, every nation made gods of their own and put them in the houses of the high places with the Samaritans had made every nation in their cities wherein they dwelt. And then there's a list of, of the people and their gods. And then verse 32. So what happened? So the priest taught the true way about the one true God, the fear of the God of heaven. But the people brought their pagan worship into the land also. So then what happened? Well, verse 32 tells you what happened. Okay. So they feared the Lord 
and made unto themselves of the lowest of them priests of the high places, which sacrificed for them in the houses of the high places. They feared the Lord and served their own gods after the manner of the nations whom they carried away from thence. In verse 34, unto this day do they after the former manners, they fear not the Lord, neither do they after their statutes or after their ordinances or after the law of the commandment which the Lord commanded the children of Jacob whom he named Israel. And then verse 41, it says a few more things, what's going on? And then verse 41, it says, so these nations feared the Lord and served their graven images, both their children and their children's children, that's two generations, and another one, okay, their children, their children's children, as did their fathers, so do they unto this day, where it go down into the third generation that's happening. So what you have in these verses, you had an introduction of the Lord God of heaven back into the land of Israel. And that he was, his, his ways, who he was, what he was like, and what he wanted was taught to the people that came to occupy the land. Now, it didn't go quite as we would have hoped it would have. And what they did, okay, so the introduction of God back into the land, what happened with these pagan people, what happened, there was an integration that took place rather than the segregation, okay, and that they separated the Lord God and worshiped him only as the one true God, Okay, they, they didn't segregate their gods, their pagan gods from the one true God. They integrated the two. And so what it says here, they feared the Lord, but served their own gods. Now, what I want to do, I'm going to leave it there. So, so you, you have enough of what I've said already. I'm not going to repeat myself again. So that's where we're at now in the text. And that's the end of the chapter. Okay. Now, let me tell you the time of our text. The time of the text is about 722 B.C., which is about 140 years before the fall of Judah and Jerusalem, the the other, the southern kingdom. And that would take place by the Babylonians. So, So the northern kingdom went first, fell to the Assyrians. That's the time of our text. The time of our God in the matter of patience had concluded. And I told you all the time, God is very long-suffering, God is very patient, but God's patience does not last forever. So the time of our God in the matter of patience, evidently, we read the text, his patience had concluded. All this, all this had actually started, okay, when the Israelites were leaving Egypt in 1446 B.C., a long time, a long time ago before this ever took place, what we have in our text. In fact, it's about 725 years of God being patient because you know from the time of Egypt till now, the people been what? All in and all out with God, okay? They're good with God, they're on board with God, they serve God, and then they get out over here out of the way. And it keeps going back and forth, back and forth, but God was patient, kept calling him back to himself. God is patient. Or if you want to go into the kingdom age of, of the Jewish people and Israel and Jerusalem, listen, you would, you would start with King Saul, which was about uh, uh, 1050 uh, uh, B.C. Now it's 722 B.C. You got about 320 years of God's patience from when the, the kingdom actually began. 320 years of God's patience. Now time had run out. And though God is long-suffering, the fact of the matter is we should never, and neither should have these people, presumed upon the patience of God that it would always be there because we never know when it might come to an end. Now, we talked a little bit about a time of our text, about 700 years before Christ was here. We talked about the time of our God and mentioning just simply about his patience. His patience ran on for hundreds of years. But it finally came to conclusion with the fall of northern Israel and their capital, Samaria. And now I want to talk about the time of our attention span. Right, our attention span. Okay. And since our attention span is, is not really that long, it's not really that long, here we go. I cannot read all the verses. I will give you the text, explain what's in the verses that we didn't read, and I'm going to go on with the rest of the sermon. You know, number one, Samaria had fallen to the Assyrians. 
Why did it fall to the Assyrians? You can find that out in verses 7 through 12 and 15 through 17 because of Israel's repeated national sins. National sins are always predicated upon personal sins and went on and on and on. Every once in a while they had a good king, most of the time not in the northern kingdom. And because of this persistence, this, 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 this just bent to go ahead and wander from God and serve pagan idols and get into all the sin and the crime of what the heathen and the pagan would do and they're supposed to be the people of God. Listen, because of those sins, and it's all explained in those verses, 7 through 12, 15 through 17, Samaria falls to the Assyrians. But God, but God was merciful it tells us, with grace and truth, so there were opportunities for confession, for repentance, for reconciliation, and for revival of God's people. You can read about that in verses 13 and 14. However, this is going quick, isn't it? However, 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 the people rejected God's patient demonstrations of merciful opportunities that were full of grace and truth that return unto him. So he became angry. Now that's a just anger. That is not a, a, a fit of uncontrollable rage, sinful rage, but just anger. God became angry and brought judgment by way of a foreign nation conquering Israel and Samaria, that nation's Assyria. You can read about that in verses 18 through 23. Now, in order, and I thought about this because I thought, I wonder why, why this king, you know, brought all these foreigners in and, in, and, and re relocated them into the land of Israel. You know, what's up with that? And, uh, but anyway, I, I came to my own conclusion. I didn't read this in any commentary. It's not that I don't study, but I, I, I drew my own conclusion. I think this, in order to minimize, why did the king do that? import other peoples into the land and, and integrate them into the land? Why, why did he do that? Uh, in order to minimize the risk in order to minimize the risk of nationalist revolts and insurrections by the Jews, the Syrian government had a program of forced relocation of other foreign peoples they had conquered. And what they did, they brought them into the land of Israel to be integrated into the remaining Jewish population of the land. And so what you did, you diluted that Jewish pride and that Jewish resentment and all that because you've had all these other people now that actually wound up outnumbering the Jews. And these people were heathen. They were pagans. We're not picking on them. It's just what they were. They were ignorant of the God of Israel. Consequently, they continued their false religious practices and uh, their, moral, their, their moral inclinations into evil. So what happened? God, God having uh, lost his holy honor in his own land with his own people, God sends lions among these people that now inhabit Israel. He sends lions, okay? Not as pets, but to pester the people and actually slay some of them to get their attention that he demands honor from them. What they do, they appeal to the king of Assyria for relief. And, uh, and a Jewish priest is commissioned and sent. He's from Bethel. He's sent back into the land of Israel in order to teach, uh, teach the relocated pagan peoples about the one true God of heaven and earth. And listen, he taught them God's words. He taught them God's ways. He taught them what God wanted. And he taught them how to worship him. And he taught them about God's works. That's what you have, verses 20 through, through 24 through 28. And in conclusion of the matter, what happened? In the end, it didn't quite work out how we would really want it to. What happened in the end of all this? Okay, it says in our text, they feared the Lord. However, they created a fraudulent priesthood of unqualified, low-life men, and they still worship their own gods. And for some reason, and the Bible never says why, for some reason, they, they never quite made the complete transition to worship the Lord God of heaven and live his ways in their lives. They, they never made that transition. They just didn't. Although they had a witness, God sent them a witness, which I thought is really, really interesting and in about how much God loves people and cares about them, even heathen people. God sent them a witness. They had a witness. They had his word. They were shown his ways. But they were never, this is where I'm going, 
Okay, they, they, they were never all in. Never all in. Never really fully persuaded. Never all in. Totally committed to the Lord God of heaven. I'm going somewhere. Honest. Yeah, I'm going to lunch. So are you. But I'm going somewhere. Okay, listen, they were never all in. To them, the Lord, the Lord, notice it's all capitals, you know, Jehovah, the Lord God of heaven, the self-existent one, the Lord had become an add-on. Do you understand that? He became an add-on to what they already had. He became an add-on. In, in other words, as, a, as an add-on, he had a place of honor. He had a, a, a position of notoriety, God did. He had a position of notoriety now. He had prominence, but not preeminence. See? He, he never stood alone in their hearts and in their minds and in their lives. You, you follow me what I've said? Are, are you with me, like, sort of, like, so far? I, I, you know, I'll take a majority, a simple majority with me so far. That's where we're at. That's what happened. So the relocated people feared the Lord and continued in their old ways. They made the Lord an add-on because they were never all in for him. Now I know we're talking about heathen people of the past. I understand that. And, and I don't know if it's a principle, but, I, but I, I, it's, it's a teaching uh, of the Old and New Testament, what, I, what I'm going to say to you, that the, 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 the moral, I think, is to this story, uh, at least for me, it, it, is still to be considered today, even though in our text we're talking about heathen people. And I realize, and I hope we're not, I'm not preaching to heathen people. Okay? So we're not talking to heathen people this morning. But the principle is still to be considered today, even for us who are Christians. Okay? You know, we're to be careful not to fear the Lord and serve our own gods. We're to be careful not to fear the Lord and serve our own interest. We're to be careful not to, serve the, uh, the, not, uh, not to fear the Lord and serve our own desires. Uh, uh, there is the principle that we're to be all in Christians because our Lord is not an add-on to our lives. You get that, don't you? He's not an add-on to our lives. He's not. You know, when you think about the Lord God, the one who has saved you, loved you, saved you, keeps you saved, and gives you a place in heaven that's reserved for you now, the one who takes care of you every day of your life and stands by you and helps you and cares for you, but says, follow me. You know, he stands alone, doesn't he? Does Jesus say about us loving him only, you know, with all our heart, soul, mind, you know? Isn't that the great commandment, the greatest commandment? Our Lord is not an add-on to our lives. Uh, he stands alone. He, he, he is worshipped alone, only him. Uh, he has preeminence, that's it, only him. He has the preeminence, that's it. He's got the spotlight. He has the glory. He, is, he has first place in our lives. And in that, it, it umbrellas all of our life, the entirety of our lives. In fact, didn't the Apostle Paul say somewhere he's our very life? I think so. So for us this morning, I, I want you to think about this. You know, I thought, you know, I thought, how dare these people would, like, you know, fear the Lord and do their own thing. <laughs> you know, incorporate their old life into the, try to incorporate their old life into new life. Incorporate their old pagan cultures and society into this, this thing, well, we're going to add the Lord into this. How dare they do that? Fear God and do what they wanted. 
be what they want to be. Worship other gods. Then I thought about us. How dare we, you know, fear the Lord and fill in the blank. So we as Christians, we stand as, as, as not being all in, and then we look at our Lord as an add-on to our life. So are we all in with the Lord? It's a biblical principle, you know, that you forsake all and follow him, he's first. Or is he an add-on to our lives? That we have him, he's part of our life, uh, we give him notoriety, you know, and uh, we give him some honor, and he's maybe even prominent in our lives, but, but he's still an add-on. Do we, do I fear the Lord and do whatever? Do I? Do you? And you know what I'm going to say. I, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. You know, we should fear the Lord. And what else? Actually, follow him. Be all in. Be all in. Now, what I'm going to do is look for that paper I had to finish my sermon, or I'll never be able to finish my sermon. It's, it's, a, it's a hymn. It's a hymn, and the hymn came to my mind. If you guys want to come up, we're going to sing in a minute. Okay, we're, 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 you're, we're, you'll be out early today. Now, listen, while I was working on the sermon, oh, I, did, oh, I found it. While I was look, working on this sermon, you know, this hymn came to my mind. This hymn came to my mind. Uh, we don't sing it a lot. Uh, this hymn came to my mind when I thought about being all in with the Lord, that the Lord should not be just an add-on in our lives, you know. The hymn is truth, speaks truth. The hymn is really demanding. And it might even be convicting, you know. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to let a woman finish my sermon. And that will probably be the first time in the last not the last time this happens but she happened to write to him what am I supposed to do you know you know I'll let a 19th century English woman Frances Habergill was a Christian poet she's a book writer she was a hymn composer she was also an accomplished singer pianist and uh, for almost the entirety of her, of her brief life, she lived about 42 years, uh, she was uh, uh, pretty frail and sickly and died at a young age. I'm, I'm going to let her present uh, the closing remarks for our sermon. And I, I think the hymn goes along with the sermon. I'm not going to comment. When I'm, when I'm done with this, we can, we can sing. Okay? And uh, you've, you've heard this hymn. It kind of goes along with the sermon. I said that already, didn't I? Sure I did. It says, you've heard this. Take my life and let it be. Consecrate it, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. And it, there's another line of that same, uh, same wording. And then verse number two, take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from thee. Take my silver and my gold. Now she's getting pushy. Take my silver and my gold. Not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine, it shall be thy royal throne. In verse number six, take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself and I will be ever only all for thee. Now I have a comment, I guess I should say. What I did, I was curious to see if she was actually all in. 
because you know about this, you know, uh, you should practice what you what? Preach. And I just out of curiosity, I would just wondered. I wondered. So I read about her life and her testimony. It was pretty spectacular and fabulous back in England, back in the mid-1800s. And it, it was it's pretty good. She was the daughter of a preacher and, uh, you know, Anglican preacher, I guess he was, and stuff. And uh, then, then I thought about, you know, it seems like she was all in, and, and the, the money thing got me. Because she used to pray over every portion of whatever she wrote. And uh, as she wrote this and prayed over that, that stanza of the hymn, um, she decided all in. She took all her jewelry and all bracelets, whatever she had, and actually contributed all, gave it all away to some, some mission uh, project somewhere. And so she did take her silver and gold, let it be the Lord's, and gave it away. So I allowed her to do this in my sermon because she has credibility. She practiced what she preached. Although women don't, you know, I, I understand. But she practiced what she preached because she wasn't like the people in the text that fear the Lord and serve their own gods. No, she feared the Lord and she served him only. She was all in. He stood alone. He wasn't an add-on. He was her life. I really do pray that for us here this morning, that we will, we will consider this, what's been said this morning, for our own lives. That we would be in all in for Christ and not be like these people that we've seen in our text this morning. Let's sing.